This is Shades of Content, a podcast created for and featuring women of color who create and distribute content as a means to tell stories to the masses. I'm your host, Patrice Camo, owner of Camp Space, and I'm passionate about giving diverse women creators a space to be awesome. Let's go. Thanks, guys, for tuning in um, to another episode of Shades of Content. I know I typically don't have introductions like this, but we recorded this episode a little differently, so I'm just hopping on to give you guys a preview of what this episode is about. I am so excited to um, release this episode featuring Takia N. Robinson, PhD, also known as Dr. Kia. Um, her official professional title is the Assistant Director of Research and Policy in the Office of Undergraduate STEM Education at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Uh, Dr. Kia has a passion for higher education research. And, you know, as you'll hear in this episode, we really talk about how she's using her educational backgrounds, her really scholarly training matched with this amazing digital network that she's built um, by sharing her authentic self and talking through the process of adulting um, and how all of that is going to work together in her just ensuring that black people and women of color are elevated, supported, and that our, and that our communities are growing. So this conversation is really amazing. Um, you probably also know of Dr. Kia because she is the co-host of the Get and Grown podcast, which is on the Loudspeakers Network. And that's a show about navigating the transitions of adulting as young Black millennials. Dr. Kia earned a BA from Manhattanville College and an MA from the University of Connecticut. She went on to earn a doctorate in education. Oh, I'm sorry, a master's in education in <laughs> higher and post-secondary education from Teachers College, Columbia University, and finally, her PhD in higher education from the University of Maryland College Park. Go Terps. I'm a Terp as well, so she and I just have this amazing connection. Um, in 2017, Dr. Kia founded Team Typing Fast, TTF, which is an online community of practice that prioritizes the wellness, success, and productivity for Black women, academics, corporate professionals and entrepreneurs. So, I mean, this woman who I've known for a while has this amazing wealth of knowledge, but is one of the most down to earth and real and honest individuals that I know um, or that I've come into contact with. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I want you guys to get into the episode. Check it out. Hey, guys, we're here with Takia Nicole Robinson, Dr. Takia. <laughs> <laughs> I am hey guys. so excited to talk to Kia, and I'm going to call you Kia, not to Kia. Please, please okay. call me Kia. Everybody calls me Kia. Yes, yes. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into Kia's story, but just a little background. Kia and I met, and I don't know if you remember this, probably like... I do. A long time ago, getting our hair done, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We were both at the green room. <laughs> the green room. Um, getting our hair done. <laughs> you were, I think, in your PhD program at the time. And that uh, mm -hmm. our hair done was really kind of like vent session. I feel like we were always just being there just like. Always. Talking. Just right. talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, yes. so to be able to interview on the podcast as a as a content creator and someone who is really pushing out content that um, inspires our tribe, but not also just the the content that you're putting out, but bringing people together um, through your in-person events. Like, I just, I just love it. So um, welcome everybody. Welcome to Kia to the podcast. Kia, briefly, briefly tell us about yourself. I know that's such a broad. I'm question. so happy to be here. It is a it's a huge question, but I'm gonna do my best not to talk for hours. Um, but yeah, it's just awesome to be here. I'm really really proud of Shades of Content and what you're building, and I was just so honored um, and grateful uh, to be asked to be a part. And so, briefly, um, my name is Kia, and I'm originally from New York. Uh, I came to the DMV. Uh, about eight years ago now, which is crazy to say out loud, to uh, start my PhD program 
at the University of Maryland College Park. Happy homecoming. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. We're proud Terps over here. And um, so, yeah, so I uh, came here for school, continued to work on campus. And after graduation, um, you know, transitioned from being a university administrator to more, more working in like the research practitioner kind of space. I now work at a think tank in D.C. or by day where we help institutional leaders solve like operational and functional problems uh, at colleges and universities, specifically around issues of like diversity, equity and inclusion, which is really, really popular, especially right now. And so we help institutions who have missions to be inclusive places with commitments to social justice. We help them kind of realize those uh, laudable goals in practice. I have, you know, got bit by the research bug. I've always been a nosy child. And I think that that's been cultivated in my, in my nerddom through manifesting as someone who has a passion for asking questions and telling stories. And a part of that, um, a part of that work has been through the Get and Grown podcast, which started shortly after I finished my PhD. I started with my good friend, Jade. Um, and it was just about navigating, uh, we call it the ghettos of adulthood. <laughs> um, literally being 20 somethings and 30 somethings who woke up one day and was like, wow, I'm a real live adult and I don't know what I'm doing. And we just talk a lot about what, uh, what these transitions mean for us um, and really kind of cultivated a community around the confusion and strife and, and struggle of, of learning how to be uh, grown adults. Um, and, you know, through that, I've been able to also kind of curate an additional kind of community for women who, we call them type fast, like we just, women who type fast, and that's not limited to academia, but because I'm an academic, it is kind of like concentrated in that space where we just get together and support one another, really find strength. I think of community as an act of resistance, as Audre Lorde put it, you know, I, I am not, I'm here solely because of the, of the women, men and women who made sure that I knew what I needed to know and had what I had to have in order to navigate college, grad school, professional life. And so I've just always had a great passion for creating those those uh, cultural spaces where that kind of cultural capital can be shared. And through that team type and fast was born. It's just by a way that we kind of chronicle our progress as we deal with uh, the different projects that we have. So whether you're working on a real estate license or you're writing a book or you're working on a business plan to start a business or you're writing a dissertation or you're submitting publications as an academic, like we come together and we support each other and, um, you know, to do, to do our work and do it well and take care of our, ourselves in the process. So that's all of the many mm. multiple parts of me yeah. and my life right now. It is a lot, but you know, I've always been a person who, who's been doing many things at one time. So it feels unnatural for me to not, to not be in that space, but really happy to be here and happy to share my story and what I'm learning about content creation yeah. and all of that. What did okay, so I don't when did you guys start getting grown? Getting grown started in March of 2017. Okay. We are almost four years old, which is crazy. Were but yeah, we were you pursuing your PhD when that was happening, or had you already gotten it, received it? So that that happened just after. Okay, so I will say that I was approached and, and encouraged by uh, you know, other podcasters to kind of jump into the podcasting space while I was writing my dissertation. And I was, it was a hard no, like, no, I'm good. I don't need another job. I'm all set. And I really, you know, I was just happy for my friends who were doing podcasts successfully and was just like, let me just be all hype, man. I'm just excited to, to support you. But, you know, it, it came back around after I finished my PhD and it was broached to me as, as, you know, I was thinking about podcasting as a space for entertainment. People listen to podcasts to be entertained. And Kid Fury was very plain with me. He was like, you know, we need podcasts of people who are telling their story. Everyone's not out here going to be a pop culture maven. There are those women who just get up every day and go to work. And they, and they would very much relate to you. Um, and so that is kind of how I was won over. And I very much started we Jade and I both started the podcast thinking oh we'll do it for 
a few months to see how, uh, you know, folks respond to it. But it really picked up in momentum rather quickly. Here we are. Can you talk me through? So because you have so many different facets, I'm going to focus on one facet and the next facet. So with Getting Grown, like it obviously popularity increased tremendously. I believe you guys are on a a network right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to hear just like, because you're you're the the homegirl, right? And you're very clearly, even though you, you're the home girl, that you have this platform that is reaching out to so many people. So I mm-hmm. like, you walk me through kind of like what, like, what did that look like to start this podcast? And then like, did it, I, obviously maybe it organically grew. Like, how did that feel for you and Jade? I had the pleasure of meeting Jade, you know, a few years back. She's yeah. still, like, absolutely. Y'all, like I said, the home girls, you know, absolutely. And, you know, how do you take and I, I say that also to say, um, and this is like, this is just what it is. You know, sometimes people are personalities, right? Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. That you get on the podcast or on the Instagram is not really who they right, are. Right, right, right. But y'all are y'all. Like, this is mm-hmm. this is your show. <laughs> and so I'm just, you know, curious, like, what, what that process was from start to where you are now. Like, maybe some things you learned. And, and then also, like, how how are you both dealing with, this popularity right because you have way more people that know you yeah it is still very strange to uh be approached or uh you know recognized in that way because it's still very much like oh gosh (laughs) but um and I have lied before like people be like are you Kia and I'd be like no (laughs) so um um it is that is very odd but I think that that's more of a function of my own personality uh, as much as I enjoy real good conversation, I'm an introvert. And so uh, being around large groups of people, specifically strangers, does kind of take a lot out of me as a person. And so I've been, I've had, it's been a, a bit of a learning curve, learning how to manage myself in situations with others. But from the very beginning, Jade and I kind of made a commitment to one another that we were just going to be friends talking. We never bro- approached this opportunity as a means to get rich and famous that still hasn't happened by the way but uh this is never a means to you know blow up it was just we are going to um you know create space for people create community and just really and really create a relatable approachable platform that people like to listen to and like to feel like they are a part of we were never ever shooting to be stars and because that's not who we are as individuals as friends um and so it has been I think I think that kind of commitment that we've made to one another in the beginning has has been really helpful because honestly we didn't pay attention to numbers and it was almost a choice it was like we're going to do this because we want to if you kind of get caught in looking at the numbers in the beginning then you start to measure your effectiveness or your success by those numbers and numbers were never what we were chasing it was more so like, we want a dope show that people are excited to listen to and that we're excited to do. And so we kind of focus our energy on really being ourselves and making something that didn't exist. It's become increasingly hard since the podcast market, market is saturated now. Like everyone has a podcast, but I still think, I think there's a, enough internet out there for all of us if we, if we commit to being, to being ourselves. And so that's really what it's, what it's been about. It's been about how do we come together and make ourselves, you know, just kind of be, be authentic. How do we, how do we commit to authenticity and that making that our, our goal. And I think the numbers and the popularity kind of came with time and consistency because we didn't, we weren't like a, we didn't take off right away, yeah. but you know, we're just continuing to show up and week after week making shows and having opportunities, you know, different opportunities come our way to get our name out there in other spaces. We've been able to grow a pretty large listenership. And I'm, I'm really grateful. I take that as a responsibility. It's not a gift. It's something that's like, I, these people, I want to give people something that they want to listen to week after week. For sure. I think, you know, you hit on obviously consistency. I think in the content creation game, consistency is like paramount or second to, you know, being honest and being authentic. But one thing that I get when I listen to the show is I feel like I'm just talking to someone I know and I feel like it's just extremely transparent Mm -hmm. 
you know, you listen to you you listen to some things, and you it just does, it kind of feels like maybe some things aren't being said, or but like you guys, this show is um, it's just like mm -hmm. no hose bar, and mm -hmm. you know, I think that that is obviously I helpful because it's like therapeutic is getting people to connect and I know that therapy is something that you talked about absolutely um, how has you know this process as being a content creator kind of helped you personally become your better self or even maybe hindered and kind of made you kind of look yeah back, talk a lot <laughs> about what content creation and being in this space how it can be so great but you know I just yeah. how it's affected you personally I, I, it's definitely been a mirror. It has pushed me to uh, really live up to the value of authenticity that I that I say that I have. Right. So I'm, I I aim to be the same Takia in every space, whether I am at the National Academies of Science presenting, or whether I am, you know, at the track <laughs> or, or in the choir stand or. You know, if you see me at a Target, I aim to be the same to Kia because I feel like it is important for me to show up in that way. And as a professional, I've, I've been forced or challenged, I should say, around showing up as Dr. Robinson and how there are parts of Dr. Robinson and Kia that can't coexist. And I have been, and, and that's something that I'm still, you know, ruminating on, but my response to that instinctually is like, nah, I feel like it's important for me to be the same, you know, hoops wearing Kia, uh, Kia in the spaces and places where girls who wear big hoops don't usually occupy. And so that standard of authenticity is really, it's like when you say something, I say all the time, like uh, adulting is, is about, um, is about making, it's like, holding you accountable to everything that you say. Every, it's making you question everything you thought you ever knew. And it's making you really, really stand firmly in who you say that you are. And so I have been tested through the show in the ways that I have, I have had to be transparent in ways that I probably wouldn't have if I didn't have the responsibility of the platform that I feel like we've created. And so as far as my own emotional health and my own journey through through therapy I have I have had to learn how to like face the facade right so we learn how and it's important in a lot of spaces when we go to work when we interact when we go outside it's like we're putting on this space of like you know everything is good I'm good I'm just here doing what I gotta do but if, if we want to create a courageous space where truth is welcome and truth is is prioritized and that requires me to tell the ugly parts of truth sometimes and not in ways that you know I'm becoming more strategic around because we say on the show like everyone's welcome at the kitchen table we have kitchen table talk so I'm finding ways to make y'all welcome enough at home and feel at home enough to sit in my kitchen table but not feel at home enough to go into my refrigerator like there are still boundaries and while I am very transparent I don't tell it all mm. because you have to keep certain things safe and sacred and protect them um, especially you know when it comes to your relationships and people who are close to you um, so there are some boundaries that you have to put around yourself because the internet kind of makes people feel like they have access to you in all kinds of ways so there are ways that I and I have learned and therapy has been very helpful in, in that sense in helping me to learn how to tell my story in in truthful and authentic ways without disclosing uh, the vulnerable parts of me that, you know, make me open for people to kind of attack me or take advantage of me in that way. So it has, it's, it's a daily challenge. And there are times when I have just kind of leapt off the cliff and say, I'm going to tell it when I didn't plan to tell it, or I'm going to say it when I didn't plan to say it. And what encourages me is the feedback. Hmm. You know, when I, when I say, there's so many men and women who reach out to me and say, I'm so, I'm very, that they're grateful that I shared what I shared because I put words to what they were experiencing. And, you know, it, it is, it has been affirming to know that I'm not the only person dealing with the challenges that I'm dealing with. And I'm grateful to know that I can be that for another person to let them know that they are not alone. Um, and we can kind of process through the craziness 
of our lives together because I mean, I don't yet have a family of my own and my, my mom and, and grandparents, you know, they grew up in different times with different generations. And so there are things that I can't necessarily talk to them about. Um, and, and they have a level of um, understanding or awareness of, and so um, I, I have come to really appreciate having the spaces where I can kind of process things in community with people who are in similar spaces than I am. And so I don't mind being vulnerable. Sometimes it is a little scary, but I'm learning that if I take the risk to, to, to go there, then I haven't yet been burned and I haven't yet said anything that I wish I hadn't. Right. And I, I've been very prayerful and asked God to guide me and word my mouth so I don't say anything crazy. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I trust that, you know, this vulnerability is really what connects us if, if we just have the courage to go there. Yeah, it, it's all about community and being able to find, like there's so many people in the world. And mm-hmm. you typically, when, you're, when you grow up, you only just see what is around you, but because of social media and the internet, right? Absolutely. You learn that there's so many people and so many experiences and so many places. And so it's like, if, you see the value in connecting with other people, no matter who they are, right? It might even be people you don't agree with. Exactly. Um, But, you know, I do think there's value in in this tool allows us to do that. Um, But then when you're able to really make that connection and you feel comfortable sharing, and then it's like that two-way, girl, I did Mm -hmm. did that too. Like, it's just so (laughs) exotic, you know? Um, Yes, absolutely. I've definitely connected with people that I never met. Who, you exactly. Know? <laughs> right, and I had no idea. I had no intention of telling you all my business today, that, but here we are, right? So, because yeah. we're all human and we're all dealing with stuff, you know, no matter what kind of Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. How are you like, okay, so you have a very professional academia, like mm-hmm. one, and then there's, you know, content creation, obviously a more creative, even team type of that's which we'll talk about. They're creative. Um, like, are the two worlds one? Like, how do you kind of wear? Yeah. So I honestly, when I first started, it was very much like I had to keep these two things very separate. And it was intentional. It was, I felt for a long time that being a creative compromise my credibility in the academic space Mm. Uh, because you know there's such a pressure there to produce like you know and to and to publish and to be out there um kind of following the formula and ticking off the markers of like what makes a successful academic a successful academic Um, and the and the more that I have been able to kind of get deeper into both of these worlds I really see a lot of overlap between the two of them yeah my goal for getting a PhD was because I felt like as a university administrator there were a lack of resources that were available to me that would help me do my job better a lot of the professional development stuff was really theoretical and wasn't really on the ground for the people who were like day-to-day serving students and you know dealing with like like the inner workings of how a college runs Mm -hmm. and I thought that the stories of the programs like my experience and perspectives of being a program administrator and being a student of certain you know student success programs were not really represented in the professional development space it was kind of like there was a big gap in what was going on in the real lives of these people and what was represented in the literature and so I was very intentional about pursuing my PhD so that I can try to fill that gap because I want I felt like what we were learning on the ground was really useful for the people who were making the decisions they just didn't know our perspective so I felt like if I could ask the right questions and learn how to get the right answers and write it all up and present it in the academic way that we can kind of address that gap I realized that a lot of the confusion and dissonance that goes on in professional spaces is that we're talking a lot to our people and the, the communication doesn't go across certain certain disciplinary boundaries. And I'm like, academics publish, we publish, 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 but we only talk to other academics. Right. When when there are when there are loads of people who are living lives and navigating the problems that we study, who would greatly benefit from all of the cool things that we learn through our research. And so 
I said, in addition to publishing as an academic, because that's still a, very, a passion of mine, I still very much engaged in writing and publishing. But in addition to that space, I want to be a part of making that work accessible to everyone, not just people who read academic journals. And so um, I didn't see this coming, but the podcast became a, a, a way, a form of media that was really useful in, in getting the stories of the research and what we're learning behind the scenes in the research into the hands and the houses and the hearts of and minds of people who would benefit from what, what we learn um, because they didn't have to read it, but they could listen to it uh, on NPR or they could listen to it uh, on a podcast. And so as I began to talk about my work on the podcast, there was this growing interest of people who wanted to learn more about what I was learning and what other academics like me were, were learning. And even on the academic side, like, you know, there's a, a program that I'm, I'm, a, I'm in charge of the social science aspect of the research team for. Even our, our clients were like, how do we get what we're learning through our studies into the hands of, of other students and teach like people who may not read our papers, like what can we do? And it was pitched, like someone pitched, like maybe we should do a couple podcast episodes about some of the things that we're learning. And so I'm, I'm now realizing that it's all about telling stories and understanding, you know, and generating knowledge and like teaching. Um, it's just a different form. It's just a different platform. Instead of writing and publishing and reading books, I share information through the podcast and um, there are folks who come up to me at academic conferences and say, I listen to Getting Grown. And there are people who listen to Getting Grown and say, because of the show, I'm going to graduate school. And so I'm learning that there is overlap between the two because essentially it's all about asking questions and telling stories and finding answers, but it's just different to different audiences. And I feel like I'm at a, at a nexus where I can kind of speak to both. And if I, if I play my cards right, I could, I could continue to, you know, I think, I think podcasts can be a viable platform for academics if we would just embrace it. And I, and I would be a part, I would like to be a part of um, that charge. I would like to be a part of disseminating the research that we work so hard on you know, to audiences that extend beyond academia. There's no reason why, you know, information that we are learning through our research is not things that should be running on news spots yeah. or should be on the shade room. I mean, like, cause, and I mean, it's real life now, especially when we think about the sociopolitical time that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. I know women who are studying public health or political science and have insights into like voter suppression mm -hmm. and like, you know, disparities around COVID that should be running on the shade room <laughs> like, because they're they impact from people like you and me yeah. who who also uh, who follow the shade room and so I want I want to be a part of bridging those gaps and I didn't see it coming but now that I'm in it I see that there's a lot of synergy between both of those worlds and there's a unique way to kind of coexist in both and that's I think that's the lane that I'm trying to occupy. Mm. Well, you know, just hearing you say that, I remember I worked at the Endocrine Society and I would have to attempt to read all of these scholarly freaking, mm -hmm. I'd be like, really? Yes. <laughs> and then put it in a press release and shoot it out. But we would never shoot it out to, we, there was never a way to connect it, right? Right. To people, like to the, say the urban community or the, mm -hmm. millennial. but like you said, I think now, now, you know, the worlds are colliding and it's so absolutely. How to, how to tell that story and then how to pitch it, which is a whole mm -hmm. tactic and skill set, but it's definitely people out here that can do it. For and sure. You got, you got multiple stories, but you have much more important, you have the awareness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's about translating. It's about yeah. making, making all things accessible. And I like to think of myself as that person. I like to think of myself as a person who can translate sophisticated theory mm. to the block. Right, <laughs> because I feel like the block needs to be made aware of what's going on up here. Um, I think a lot of the inequity that we see in our society is because of a lack of understanding and a lack of information. And I've been privileged to be in some rooms that I never thought that I'd be in, but by virtue of the credentials that I have, I've learned some things. And it's always been my mission to make the things that I'm aware of in these little in these rooms. I want to make make everybody I know aware of them because they have implications for all of us. Like, 
like my grandma needs to understand what's going on in the boardroom right. as it relates to her social security, right. as it relates to her health care, as it relates to, you know, you know, the ways in which children around her are being educated or, or miseducated. There are things that she needs to know, but no one has taken the time to tell her that in the language that she can hear it. So if podcasting is a way that we can start to translate and make, make the information that we all need accessible to everyone, I'd like to be a part of, you know, kind of ushering us into this place. Because I think the internet gives us, gives us the access, the, the, yep. the means to do it. It's just a matter of getting it done. Getting it done. And I, um, you know, so to, to piggyback on accessibility, you took, we talked a little bit about team typing fast. Um, right. And I had the pleasure of being at one of the events because you had it in my hosting, team. hosting one of the events. We thank you. We still thank you so much. Oh man, that was lovely. You totally turned this place into just. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> like, can you give a little more background on how this in person event came? Not even came to be, but like why you felt the need to make people come together. Um, you rely so much on this virtual. Obviously absolutely before, absolutely but, you know and so okay I, I have been uh throughout my like academic and professional journey I have been the only black girl multiple times from elementary school all the way on up I have been the only black girl in a grad program I've been the only black girl on a job in a, in a specific department or in a specific role and I know how isolating that can be and it's not necessarily restricted to proximity. Um, you know what I'm saying? You have been around, you know, all skin folk and kin folk. Uh, and, you know, there are some allies out there. But for the most part, when you are, and in my experience, when I have been in these places, I have had to figure a lot of things out on my own. Yeah. And when, when, I, when I have been able to connect with other like-minded people who I trust, who I could trust, I found so much safety and security in those connections and that community that it pushed me forward. You know, being, so Team Cyber Fast was kind of born through my dissertation work. You know, I, when I had the opportunity to be on the read, uh, I think it was 2015, I was on an episode of the read and um, uh, it was Thanksgiving break. And uh, everyone was kind of talking about what their holiday plans were. And I had just at that time defended my dissertation proposal. And so everyone was like, well, Kia, what are you going to be doing for Thanksgiving? I said, I'm going to be somewhere typing real fast, just in a corner, typing fast because I've got work to do. I mean, we've got pages to write. I'm just going to be typing. And, you know, just because of who I am, you know, I made a little hashtag. And when I would, um, you know, reach a little milestone or it was kind of like how I chronicled my progress of completing my dissertation. I would say, man, today was hard. I only wrote three words, team type of fast. Or I was like, I killed it today. I wrote 3,100 words, team type of fast. And unbeknownst to me, other people started using the hashtag and people started, you know, I, you know, defending my dissertation proposal today, or I passed my comps today, or I got my real estate license today. And it became a place where we can just kind of big up each other and give each other a little high five because we were all in our respective places doing our work. And I randomly just asked one day, like, you know, we should really kind of get together. This little internet thing is kind of growing. Y'all be talking on a hashtag. We should just kind of, what if we just kind of like, you know, got together and on a whim, I just said, I think I want to do something around my birthday. And I took my own little money, you know, got some food and has, had a team of people helping me out and rented out a space. We started off, the very first one was in a community room in an apartment building on Rhode Island Avenue. And I just just took a took a leap. It was like, you know, I'm going to put this out here. People said that, that they would come. We're just going to get together and talk about you know, what it's like to be the only Black girl in your workspace or at your school space and, you know, what this little community of having just a little online, um, you know, accountability partners and people to kind of big you up and encourage you and like what that has meant for you and your success and in your work life and why this community amongst women of color is so important. And I'm just going to rent a little room and have some hors d'oeuvres and see if y'all will come. And I put the tickets up on Eventbrite and sold them out in three days. Wow. And uh, it was, it just became a thing. 
And I didn't realize it until the people were in the room, but it was just a, a beautiful space. We get together, kind of talk about what our challenges are, what some of the things that we're learning. And, you know, at each event, I would invite an elder or someone who I have a lot of respect for to come and kind of share their wisdom, their insight. And we just had conversation. And that's how it, it was born. A, again, that storytelling. And I feel like me being alone and isolated in these, in these spaces, you know, it was more getting through, getting through grad school, getting through your, your work life, navigating the, the corporate ladder successfully. It's not just what you learn in school. And it's not just like the tips that you find on BuzzFeed. Right. But there are certain things that are specific to Black women that you know that, that only another Black girl who's been in your position or who is aspiring to your position, like there's certain rules that we have to follow. Mm. that and and I just wanted to be in a space where that kind of cultural capital can happen because when I was at I have a master's degree from UConn and was the only black girl in a 30 mile radius it felt like until I found the African-American cultural center on campus and it was in those conversations where I learned where I can get my hair done mm -hmm. where I could you know go to church um you know who did the best nails <laughs> and I mean we laugh and these sound like really small things but also I learned which professors to stay away from, which right. professors to ask for recommendations letters and which not to. Right. Um, so it was these little communities and this the, the places where this cultural capital is so golden and it's so key to know that if you live on this side of town, you should live here and you shouldn't live there. Right. <laughs> um, right. and, and I wanted to just kind of create spaces where that kind of information can be shared with the someone who, uh, you know, a young educator who is aspiring to be a principal gets to talk to someone who's been in, who's been a principal for four and five years and just learn the little nuances and subtleties about how to get on that track trajectory that you don't, you know, that, that they don't tell you in HR, but there are certain things that we need to know. And so Team Typing Fast was birthed out of that, birthed out of me understanding that I wouldn't be where I am without the tribe of men and women that put me to the side and said, don't do that again. Mm. Or make sure you do that again. Right. So it it's about trying to make, make those connections for other women who are like me, who are isolated in their, in their undergraduate programs or graduate programs or at their jobs and just feel like they don't have anyone that can help them. If they can find a little piece of that through anything that we're doing virtually or in person in Team Typing Fast, then that is, that is me reaching my goal. How has COVID affected <laughs> from mm -hmm. the creator side to, you know, your academia? Wow. Like, is, how has your life shifted, if, it, if, if any? It has. It has totally shifted. I think COVID has been an interruption in many respects. It showed me that our plans are just that, plans, and that, you know, success is about adaptability. Wow. And that is in academia, that's in business, that's in, you know, content creation. I think COVID has shifted everything around in a way that has let me know that if I'm going to survive it, I have to learn how to adapt and adjust. And that's been hard for me, someone who is used to being in control and having timelines and goals and setting them and meeting them by, you know, a certain time. I'm learning as a aspiring entrepreneur, COVID has been a, a master teacher in, in letting me know, you know, showing me where I, where I was insufficient, where I needed more support, where I needed more skills. It's tested my commitment to all of this and my creativity, right? Because, you know, when, when the world is on fire, and every time you come on the TV or look on your timeline, you're just bombarded with bad news. It's hard for me to be inspired to continue to create when you're just trying to process all the crazy. But it has, you know, COVID has, and, and that, that's been the part of, of this, these last few months that has been challenging. And so, you know, it, it slowed me down. Like we had plans for there to be, you know, several in-person yeah. Team Typing Fast events. We had plans for there to be several getting grown live shows. We had plans for all kinds of things. And COVID has just put a complete stop to all of that. Yeah. And so my focus now on, and for the last few months has been, 
you know, all of our needs have kind of shifted now that we're all at home. So how, how can Team Typing Fast and Getting Grown adjust and adapt to continue to meet the needs of our constituents, of our community members? Where can we meet the girls where they are? And so, I, and, and how do I take care of myself in the process, right? So that's, 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 been, <laughs> that's been another challenge because, you know, for a long time, you know, Team Typing Fast has been a passion project for me. And so I didn't really have a business plan about it. It was just kind of like wherever my heart was leading me, I would just try to get some resources together and do it. But this has shown me that, you know, I have built something that people are interested in. And so now I am responsible to really build an infrastructure so that it can be self-sustaining and not relying on me in my hands yeah. all the time. And so I've had to slow down to really ch- kind of go back and try to rebuild this thing in a way that it doesn't all fall on, on me. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've had to take some L's in the process, but I'm hoping, my hope is that, you know, by, by investing the time and the money and the attention to really building this out right now, that it will pay off in the long run, you know, by, by being a self-sustaining kind of, kind of thing. And so I'm, it has, it has been hard, right. But I I see all disruptions and all interruptions, um, as God's way of teaching us things about ourselves. And so I'm trying to embrace the lessons that have come through all of the shifts and adjustments I've had to make over the past few months. And, you know, use that to inform how we do things going forward. And so we, we for a little while, we're doing some virtual writing sessions that were really successful. People just kind of meeting together in Zoom and having a playlist and working together in that way. We're working on doing like a virtual event, hopefully by the end of the year um, or early, early 2021. And really just trying to like, like I was, like we were talking about before, like how do we we adjust team typing fast so that it can meet the needs of folks right now? Um, because you know, schools are are you know, all lots of colleges and universities are either all virtual or some hybrid, um, and, and that goes for you know, K twelve and other educational spaces of some businesses and everyone's other entrepreneurs have had to adjust and take hits and all of that. So given all of that and and where folks are, how can we continue to find ways to come together and share those stories and support each other? You know, with, with COVID, obviously we saw all the interruptions and we saw, you know, some, obviously there's been negative things that have happened, you know, over the last, um, but one of the interesting things that, uh, that I'm sure that you not benefited from, but that may have affected you was the increase wanting to hear the voices of women of color, black women, right? They right, were right. Women, and, you know, the world finally realized how valuable our voices are. Um, and so I'm curious how that affected you, if it did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you could say to someone who is not a, a, a woman of color content creator, like, what would you say to someone who is now so interested in, in our voices? I think, well, it's definitely impacted me professionally and, and with respect to, you know, content creation, because I think it it has, I I don't know that I, I think I always knew, right. Because you experienced, I've experienced it, but I don't think I, I, I understood the degree to which our bodies, our voices, our perspectives, our contributions were taken for granted and overlooked and dismissed, right? And now, because it's trendy, you know, folks want to hear from Black women and spotlight Black women. And I, I do feel like it's a, it's about time. And, there, and I do feel like there are some things that we should take advantage of, you know, as, as, as women of color, Black women specifically, we should absolutely take the platform, take the microphone, take the stage and be our best, be the best, brightest, amazing, brilliant self that we've always been. I don't know. I guess I'm thinking about your, what would I say to 
folks who are just now getting here. <laughs> it's like y'all are like we like y'all are late, and um, yeah. you know, but you got a lot of you got a lot of catching up to do. And don't yeah. think that, and don't think that this is going to be, you know, this surge of appreciation and recognition and acknowledgement of black women is a fad like this is not going nowhere we're here to stay you've given us these platforms and we're not relinquishing them so so <laughs> you know and 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 to put your put your money where your mouth is in terms of i think uh we hear the word allies a, a lot right and we hear people who assert themselves as allies and identify themselves as allies to the movement, allies to the cause, allies to us. And I feel like your privilege and your allyship is more than what you say, right? You got to put it where your mouth is. What are the ways that you are willing to silence yourself to give, give space and opportunity for another voice to be at the table? And I don't know that we recognize that. And I, I, I preach this sermon at work all the time for people who say that they have commitments to inclusion, mm. but don't recognize that inclusion costs. And that means if we really going to be equitable and, and inclusive, that means some of y'all got to get up so other people can sit at the table. That means you might have to take a pay cut so that other people can get just, you know, can so we can, we can really level the playing field. And I think that's when the rubber meets the road. Like you call yourself an ally, you call yourself a supporter, you say that you want to be a part of shining light and uh, giving sound to the voices of Black women. You do know that you have to do that at your expense sometimes. Yeah, for it to really matter. For right? it to really matter. And because hmm. interest, interest convergence is a thing. So if, if it's mutually beneficial, is it really change yeah yeah so so i think i think we have a, a lot more conversation that that needs to be had right because all of this talk of inclusion and it's when i talked about this when i had the, the privilege of writing the piece for for essence around cheap change right like change real change and transformation is expensive it's going to cost some of you more than like we've been paying the price black women black people we have paid the price of oppression mm. for hundreds of years. And if y'all really want to talk change and transformation, then it's now time yeah. for you guys to start paying the costs. Yeah. And us to start getting the return. Mm. So it is it is more than so that that's that's my that's my hope for all of the allies and folks of color. Like, you know, I want you to recognize that a part of your privilege and you really recognizing it means that you have to deny some parts of yourself and your access in order for you to really make the playing field as level as you say it should be. I think that is so black and white and easily understood. I was looking at a, a post today, I think on Charlemagne's page and mm -hmm. talk about black privilege and you know, a, a Caucasian woman said, it's, there were a few, one person was like, you know, the black privilege is way more than the white privilege. And then there was a white lady saying, but you just said it so clearly. <laughs> I don't think, and I think it's, it's, it is, it is something that I don't, I don't know why it's not as um, apparent as I feel like it should be, but it's not. And, and it's, it's something, it's this part of the process that a lot of people miss. And I was in a conference earlier, actually last week, I was in a conference last week of faculty who were saying that they're committed to inclusion. Mm. Um, we're committed to making our classrooms, our departments, our programs, inclusive spaces. And then the, the next, you know, the very next statement or part of the conversation after that was about how do we incentivize, how do we incentivize our colleagues to, to change, you know, to adopt these inclusive practices and pedagogies. And I'm like, that's backwards yeah. because folks who are truly invested in inclusion and equity shouldn't have to get paid more <laughs> money. That's right. So you saying, I fully believe that everybody ought to get uh, equal share and equal shot. I'm not giving up nothing though. Mm, at all. <laughs> like, I'm not giving up nothing. I actually expect to get more. Right. I expect you to pay me more yeah. money uh, in order deep. for me to, like, I'm like, that's heavy. That's real heavy. We got, that we shouldn't be talking like, you know, I don't, and I don't know if we, and I was like, I don't, to me, it, it blows my mind. That is just like, no one raises, no one raises a question. 
that's around that. It's the norm. It's like, I'm not going to give up anything, but I surely believe that you should have everything that I have. I'm not going to give you anything though. Mm. Nah, I actually need more. I'm actually going to need more money in order for me to even to, to, to change my practice for me to change the way I write my syllabi for me to change the way that I enforce, you know, an inclusive culture in my classroom for me to make sure that other students don't mistreat or marginalize students other students based on their skin color or their gender or their sexual orientation. I need a pay bump mm. in order for me to do that. But I'm wholly full sale, wholesale committed <laughs> to the cause of inclusion. I believe it in my heart. Oh, I don't think yeah. anyone should go without, but you just gonna have to give me my money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so so I don't and I and I don't know what that's a I was like, wow, that fell on me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, I don't understand how this is not apparent. Like that's not. That's not what, that's like, if we got four jelly beans and I have six and you have two, and I know, I, I believe everybody ought to have four jelly beans. I'm not giving, Patrice. I'm not giving none of mine. <laughs> like, these mine, these mine. And I know that, we, I know that if Patrice wants to be where I am, she needs at least four and I have six. I'm not giving her nothing. That's her problem. Yeah, Even though I believe, I believe that she ought to be over here with me. And I feel like, and I don't know. I don't know what that, I don't know. I don't know how we got there, but this is, these are the conversations that I feel like are happening at the same time that people are saying they're committed to change. Yeah. And I'm like, y'all say it, but you don't really mean it. And so now when I'm talking about when I, that's a test, right? So it's more than just what your mouth say. So when I listen to other content creators and other bloggers and influencers who are saying that they feel like we, sh we need to be shining light on black women voices, what about what about your platform? What about your your brand? What about your influence? Are you ready? Are you are you willing to put up so that another woman can have what you have? And I mean, it. it and I think that that th the same goes for me. I think about it now. You know, Jade and I we promote other businesses, other podcasts on our show. When folks tweet us, we retweet, we share things because I feel like yeah. it doesn't cost me anything to promote shades of content. Because folks can listen to both shows at the same time and do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So why? Yeah. So I just, I just, that's 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 what I would love to to know from, you know, it's gonna have to cost. What are you willing to put up? For sure. Highs and lows of this. I mean, I would say content creator process. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's too limiting. Um, no, no, no. I think it's all content creation. Yeah. Highs and lows. I get stuck. Um, my lows is like, you know, my flow is not steady. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know I have I have other content creator friends and just friends in general, other professional friends who I feel like have they have a steady flow of ideas. Like it's like a faucet. They just turn it on and it's always there. And you know, mine can really kind of sputter sometimes. And I feel like I have to be in a space to continue to create. And so I'm learning how to take better care of myself and learn how to, you know, how do I, how do I ensure the optimal conditions that I need? I'm learning what the kinds of things that facilitate my creativity. So I'm learning how to set my life up to make sure I can have access to those conditions all the time. But that's definitely a low. There are times when we struggle to think about what this week's show is going to be like, uh, be about. We struggle to, you know, and, and especially with Teen Type and Fast, like having to adjust and think and, and reimagine how we, how we do what we do, how we do what we've done for so long. That has been hard and scary. And because I'm a person who prides herself on doing things well. And so a lot of this is uncharted waters for me. I don't know how to do a lot of this. And that makes me scared. And so a lot of people have to push me to try because I'd be like, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's just, and you know, it's easy for me to, you know, I have other things to do. So it's easy for me to just kind of put things off. But I'm I'm grateful that God's given me a strong team um, of people who don't let me kind of get stuck in my and, and get in my own way and talk myself out of things. But there have definitely been some some lows, you know. And I mean, right when we first started out, you know, and, and we ain't have no money. You know, stuff costs money, like like uh, money. <laughs> equipment, everything, editing, all of these things cost money. And it's like, you know, doing events, all of these events cost money. And it's it's upfront money. You gotta pay 
the venues and catering and there's things that happen before you get to see the proceeds of your ticket sales. And you know, all of all of these things have been some lows. Some highs have been, I'm still, I am steadily blown away by the amount of people that listen to Getting Grown. Yeah. Blown away. I mean, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, Jade and I, and we stumbled on it because we like, again, we don't really check our numbers. We're not really into the numbers because I feel like that's dangerous. And we don't read comments. I don't know about Jade, but Asante from the friend zone made me promise that I would not get caught up in the comments. And he and there's like certain blogs and certain message boards that he made me promise never to go to. Because he was like, you know, reading the comments will stifle your, like it will make you want to quit mm. trying to please people, understand what they mad about. Mm. You get caught up in trying to answer them comments and it, and it doesn't serve you. Yeah. So I don't read comments and I don't, I try my best not to look at numbers, but uh, Jade and I a few weeks ago looked at the looked at the numbers and realized that we had 8.5 million downloads. And it was just like, what? Right. <laughs> dumb. I was just saying that it's so That's dumb. Crazy. Cause it's like, when you really think about that, I'm like, you mean over 8 million people have pushed play That's and listened to me say anything. God knows what, honey, because I'll be saying a little bit everything on that show. Sometimes <laughs> it makes me nervous. But I'm, my mind is blown away by that. And I'm humbled. I'm humbled by that. And that's really, it's like, wow, that makes it, that makes it a responsibility to me. I don't take it lightly. But that's really an amazing, amazing high. I've been asked to write a couple of pieces for Essence at this point. And just growing up in a Black woman house, and my mama having Essence magazines on the coffee table. <laughs> so being... Being approached by an editor at Essence and asked to write something was just like, what? Like, like, yeah, so that was, um, that was amazing. And I mean, it's really been illuminating to, I mean, I, I love, like I said, I love getting the feedback from people, people saying that they connect with the show, or that they connect with something that I said or, um, or tweeted or posted or something. That's also it really does. Um, it's a blessing. I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm just amazed. I had no idea. Like I said, we we did get in grown thinking we would do it for maybe six months. Mm. Tops. Like, <laughs> they had no intention that it was going to be a thing. But here we are four years later. And so I'm just riding the wave, man. I don't know where it's going to end up. I, I have some ideas. And like I was saying before, I'm I'm really inspired by the synergy that I'm seeing between like my professional work and this podcast space um, and this like whole virtual internet community building kind of space. And so I'm excited about what that might, the, the potential of that. And yeah. I have ideas and I'm just praying that God give me what I need to follow through. Yeah. I think it could be a thing. There's so this, um, this feeling of like when the two worlds finally like just come together or the three worlds or whatever and you you can literally see how all of those things can work together to help you achieve your goals and help you to reach your dreams and um I'm in the same space with you right now yeah it's, it's pretty cool where um so so I want to keep it real because when people listen to this I always want them to walk away like with something like super tangible that they can do Okay. Right. So you said to be consistent yes. for creation and um, also like that authentic slash transparency just always seems to go so much further, right? Because it's connected. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would there be maybe one other thing that, you know, you would tell a soon to be podcaster or writer or mm -hmm. something that you have seen help you in yeah. getting to those next steps? It's been, it's, it's going to sound real cliche, but it's honest. You have to be yourself. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to get caught up in wanting to mirror or mimic our favorite shows and our favorite people. And we want to build things that look like some of our favorite things. Yeah. But I'm really learning. I think a part of that, that transparency, that authentic, that authenticity piece, like really, like it's really about me really knowing learning learning and knowing and coming to love and appreciate all the parts of me yeah. I follow my leak teal and I'm inspired by who she is and what she's built and 
I've heard her say several times at this point that, you know, I'm the sauce, right? And it sounds real like snooty, yeah. but I get it. Yeah. Because it's like, I am the sauce. I could give you the formula and tell you exactly what I did, but I cannot promise that you will have the success that I had because I'm the sauce. I did it. I did it this way. And I'm me doing, I'm me doing it. I'm yeah. me doing it. Yep. And so that's why I feel like there's, that's why I love, it doesn't bother me. And I'm, I'm, I'm an open book when it comes to a lot of those things, especially on getting grown. Like I'll tell y'all how to do it. I'll tell y'all what equipment we use. I'll tell y'all what, pla- like I'll tell y'all because it doesn't cost me anything. I don't feel like you're going to go out and do it better than me because you can't beat me at being me. That's it. You can't. And I think that has really been like, to going back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago about finding the synergy when all the different parts of you come together, I think that has been what's become most trans, like most inspiring, most most illuminating. I guess I think that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Is because like it reveals different parts of myself to me. Yeah. When I've been out here trying to be like my mentors, when I have committed to showing up at Sakia everywhere I go, is when doors started opening and things started moving. And I say this, you know, a lot. So when I talk to kids and undergrads and those kinds of things, I think about, I mean, I'm a spiritual person. I have a real tight relationship with the Lord. So I think about it like when 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 God made, when he was sitting, he was sitting somewhere and said, I'm gonna make me a tequila one day and she's gonna do this. Yep. And I don't know what the this is, but I'm working to figure out what that is because I feel like I was made to do certain things. And I'm working my butt off to find out what the this is. Right. Because when God made me, I feel like he was excited. Yeah. <laughs> she's going to she's gonna do this. She's going to fulfill this gap. She's going to answer these questions. She's going to be in this space. She's going to meet these needs. I'm making me a tequila for this purpose. Yeah. And so I'm working and studying and reflecting and learning and praying and studying to find that place. Not the interesting. Uh, sorry to cut you off. I think that no, the this, I think there are multiple. Absolutely. Are Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I, we get caught up all the time in, and I, I don't know, I, this manifests in me a lot of different ways. I watch shows now, like the reality shows where like um, Love and Marriage Huntsville, where I feel like these, these young couples, right? The wives, they get married at like 22 and they have their, their families. And then after their kids get a little age on them, they start doing other things. They go to school, they get on TV, they open businesses. And their husbands is like, wait, but you is my wife. And she was like, I, so it's like, you know, I just feel like, no, I don't feel like any one person is designed to do. Exactly. But I don't think, I don't think when the God, when, and it, I mean, maybe I'm wrong and I hope no one takes offense to this, but I don't believe that the Lord said, I'm going to make me as a kid. She's going to be a mother and that's it. Right. I don't no. think <laughs> That it's always a both and it's always a both and always yeah mm-hmm. we are we can we are so multi-dimensional and I think the the um the difference or the 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 thing that hinders some from seeing all those other things is fear mm-hmm. uh, you know there's just a lot of things but I, I really do hope and pray that like these conversations spark somebody to be like I'm gonna do this like, for sure I'm gonna for do sure this. And that's it. Like it, and that's it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna share because you mentioned another thing, you know, about the the sharing and like not holding on to information. I've read a long Russell Simmons wrote a book, and I always forget the name of the book, but the basic the premise was that none of this is ours anyway. Right. Like God is letting us use it to, to right. we're supposed to be honoring him. We're supposed to mm-hmm. be other people with it. You know what I'm saying? So the the point is for us to to give it absolutely right? We're supposed to be serving it no matter what you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying so um yeah I definitely feel you on all of those points for sure for sure Nikia I have just clearly we ran over time my apologies oh girl I'm fine we'll be sitting here <laughs> yes I, I have it. had loads of fun and again I'm very proud of what you're doing and all the ways that you're growing. Shades of Constant is lit, and I'm very excited to be a part of the family of, of women content creators. I'm honored that you asked me to be a part. I'm just, I'm proud. Thank you. 
Sure. No, it, it's my pleasure. Um, and I just love that we can like, I like, like, like you said, everybody has these different, there's different parts of us, but I just mm-hmm. also enjoy when I can connect with people on their on different parts. Like we could be yeah. kicking it here, but we mm-hmm. can have a really cool conversation and we can work together. Like, yep. And so I appreciate you just supporting my business. And of um, course. yeah, I, I really do appreciate you. So this was great. I will be sure to link to all of the goodness that Sakia has from her social media pages to her recent article with Essence. But yeah, thank you so much, Sakia. Thank you, Patrice. Have a good day or evening. You too. Yes, have a good one. Shades of Content is brought to you by Recorded at Camp Space, a content creator studio for women of color. To learn more, visit www.campworkspace.com.